when, uh, when I was thinking, asking the Lord, what, what should I talk about? I don't want to just talk about something. I want it to be something life-giving. And I felt like the Lord said, just share your faith journey. And so this past year, uh, Karen and I have been on a, quite a faith journey. Uh, I think your queen would describe it as how is how is anim, an, animus horribles. Animus yes, that has been our year. It's been a horrible year, and God has been faithful through it all. Um, in in February, I went into my job, um, and my boss came in and said, "We're rearranging things, and we're closing down this office." And all of a sudden, I was unemployed and it was quite a shock to me this was a job that I knew God had opened the door he had miraculously opened the door for me to be in this position and it was a it was a job I absolutely loved it fit me to a T and it closed down and to the man of faith I am I found myself many times crumpled on the floor just crying God what am I to do what am I supposed to do I don't know how to start over at my age. I don't know how, I don't know where to begin, I don't know where to start, I don't know that I have the energy to, to start over again. And um, there was this struggle going on inside of me. One side of me was reading the scriptures that say, do not fear, do not fear, do not be afraid, do not worry. He was saying, I've got bills to pay. I've got to feed my family. I have these responsibilities. And, and it's like, I want to live on this side. I want to not worry. I want to live in faith. But the reality is, I don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know what we're going to do. And so I struggled with God. How do I, how do I juggle this? How do I live like this? I, I don't know how to do it. And then one day, it's like, I, if... If I just ignore all my concerns and the reality of what's going on, I feel like I'm stuffing it down and just uh, denying it. And it's naive to think that I could stuff it down and it not explode at some point. And nobody wants that. That's not pleasing to God. That's not living a godly life. So God, how? How do I do this? I, don't, I honestly don't know how to reconcile this. And I was sitting in church and the pastor was speaking, and God just planted this little thought in my mind. And it wasn't anything to do with what the pastor was saying. It wasn't anything to do with what had happened that day. God bypassed the pastor and spoke directly to me. And, and he says, it is not naive or being in denial to focus on my provision rather than focus on the problem. In other words, there's a balance. Seeing the reality of the situation but also seeing the reality of God and his promises and his faithfulness so that I don't have to stuff down all these things that uh, are causing me to worry. I just have to see it in the light of God's word, of his promises. You know, I remember when I was young, the, the first men that walked on the moon, they said they could raise up their hand and block out the entire earth with their hand. And that's what my worries were doing. They were so close to my eyes that they were blocking out God. They were blocking out his promises, blocking out what, what uh, he wanted to, to do in this situation. Uh, I love the example of Abraham that Romans gives us. In Romans 4, it says, Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. I love the fact that Abraham did not deny the fact that he was 100 years old and that his body was as good as dead and so was Sarah's. 
He acknowledged the fact. This is the fact. But God has said this. And it, it impresses me so much that his faith did not weaken. It grew. That's, that's the kind of faith I want to have. I want my faith to grow through the trial, not weaken. I can just imagine Abraham saying, the situation is getting worse and worse. I'm getting older and older. Sarah is older. There's no way this is going to happen. I can't wait to see how God's going to pull this off. And so that is, a, that is such an example to me of seeing the reality of the situation and yet seeing God's promise at the same time. Um, so here I was, unemployed. We, Karen and I prayed. God, uh, we ask that you would open a door that I'm supposed to walk through and please close any doors I'm not supposed to walk through because I am not smart enough and I'm desperate enough. I will probably jump on any door that opens. So please don't open any doors I'm not supposed to walk through. And so uh, I applied for jobs uh, that were perfect. Things I had done in the past, this is a perfect fit for me and would hear nothing. Time after time after time. I even signed up to deliver groceries and didn't get a call back. It's like, God, you really have closed this door. Thank you for protecting me because that was just an act of desperation. Thank you for protecting me for not opening that door because you have a door. So uh, God kept telling us, wait on me. Wait on me. Just wait. And that's, that's a difficult thing to do, is just stop and wait. And so I, I just prayed, God, I want to wait well. I don't know how to wait well. Would you teach me how to wait well? Um, because it seems like nothing is happening. I don't know if you're familiar with this quote by C.S. Lewis that says, God whispers to us in, his, in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. In the midst of the pain, God is really able to speak to us clearly. And so while nothing was happening outwardly, he was doing an inward work in us. And I was, I was in this waiting time thinking, God, this is wasted time. And God is saying, this is a time of preparation. And I'm saying, God, this is a time where I'm totally insecure. And God is saying, this is a time where I am building a firm foundation. And I am saying, God, I have nothing to offer. And he is saying, I am making you an empty vessel that I can fill. I'm saying, God, this is just a time of loss. And God is seeing it as a time of new beginnings. I see it as a time of hopelessness. But God is, sees it God sees all the good he has stored up for the righteous. I see it as a dead end. God sees mind-blowing plans that he has prepared in advance for those who love him. So God, I want to wait well. I want, to, I want when I get to the end of this process, I don't want to be embarrassed that I didn't trust you. I want to, I want to get to the end of it and be glad that I trusted your word because I know you're going to be faithful even if I fall apart. So after through all of this, months and months and months, one door opened, and it was the door to come to YWAM here at Faith Bible College. And so we were so excited because Karen and I met in YWAM. Our daughters were born in YWAM. Then we went and got jobs and lived a normal life. And so uh, our desire had always been to get back into missions. So this was our heart's desire God was giving us. And we were so excited about it. We, we made our, our travel plans. We bought our tickets on faith. And uh, we were getting ready to come. And just weeks before we came, Karen was diagnosed with cancer. It's like, God, what is this? It's like, you open this door, and it feels like, now you're yanking the rug out from under us, and it feels like you're teasing us. This does not seem like goodness. This seems cruel that you would give us this hope and then drag it away. But it, it worked out in the timing. She, she went for tests. 
She had surgery. The doctors felt like they got it all. No further treatment was required, and they released her to come, no restrictions, to come on this trip. And so God was faithful after all. And even in the midst of that, God was teaching us lessons. And Karen's going to share a little bit about that in just a few minutes. But you know, we are all on a walk of faith. If we're walking with the Lord, we are all on a journey, a journey of faith. And there's uncertainty, and there's things we don't understand. And I don't like this, but uncertainty can be a gift from God. I don't like saying that because I don't like uncertainty. But uncertainty can be a gift from God because it forces us into him. It forces us to, to figure out what is really important and get down to the basics of what I believe about God and what he says. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, quote from Mother Teresa, but she said, I know God will not give me more than I can bear. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. And I, and that's, and I, I can relate to that. It's like, God, you trust me more than I think you should because I don't know that I can get through this. And it force, uncertainty and problems force us into God. And that is, that's always a good thing. So, you know, here we are, and we still have questions. There's still uncertainty. All the, all the boxes haven't been filled in yet, and my questions just fall into a few categories, like who, what, when, where, why, and how in the world are you going to work this out? But uh, when I was packing and, and putting things in a suitcase, I was just kind of talking with God, and I just said, God, you're sending us out into the great unknown. And I felt a check in my spirit. And he said, no. I'm the great known. You know me. So you're not going into the unknown. You're going with me. You may have questions, and you may have um, uncertainty. You may not have all your plans, but you know me. And so you're going out into the great known. You're going out in me. And so that, that was a great encouragement to me. Because God's certainty, the certainty of God's promises and the certainty of his word is stronger than any uncertainty I will ever face. You know, I was, we were here the first day, the first full day we were in country. I was walking on one of these beautiful paths that you have around the city. And uh, if the sun was just going down and there was, there was a Y in the path and I was going to go this way and there was a man coming this way walking his dog. And as I passed him, I recognized him. It was a man I had known when I served on mercy ships decades ago. And it's like my first full day in the country, and I run into somebody I know. I know New Zealand is a small country, but it's not that small. And I just felt like God showed me when you're obeying me and you're following me, I can put you any place I need to put you at just the right time. Ten seconds, if I had been ten seconds further on the path, I would have missed him. And that just encouraged me. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. But God knows how to put us exactly where he needs us to be at just the right time when he needs us to be there. If we're submitted to him and we're following him. In uh, Psalm 130, I'm going to read this one verse and then I'm going to ask Karen to come up. And just share some of what God's been doing in her life. Psalm 130, verse 5. And I keep reminding the Lord of this verse. It says, I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. So God, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going on, but I'm counting on you. I'm putting my hope in your word. And... We know that he is always faithful. He, he doesn't always give us answers, but he's always faithful. And uh, he's worthy and worth trusting and following. So Karen, would you come up and just share some of the things that God's been showing you?
tag team. <clears throat> you know, it's so crazy when Bob lost his job. The struggles that he had were not my struggles. He has always had a heart, like because of being the breadwinner, it's always been like if the finances don't come through, oh my gosh. And I've always, because we lived for 15 years in missions, I'm like, remember the time God provided that van when we needed to go to my parents' 50th anniversary? Remember the groceries that showed up on the doorstep? Remember the little house he gave us? I mean, I, that was not my struggle. And as a wife, I can say, well, God is really working on Bob. But you know, that wasn't, he would be like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I'd be like, God's got this, babe. But then, you know, God didn't want it to be lopsided. So probably in, in June, when we had our tickets booked, um, because he had lost his job, I didn't do my wellness checks that I normally do. And so in June, I went for my mammogram. Then they said, come back. So they've done that to me before, so I know, not yet, don't worry yet. And then they're like, no, we need to do a biopsy. And then I'm like, they, no, we need to do two biopsies. And so then I'm going, oh. And the whole time I'm like, God, you said we were so, you opened the door for us to go to New Zealand. And if I've got cancer, we're not going. I got chemo to look forward to, radiation to look forward to. Now, I, I actually had breast cancer 10 years ago. And when they called 10 years ago, and you know, I don't know how they do it here, hopefully a little bit better than they do it in the States, but some little nurse just rings you up and says, oh, you have breast cancer and um, we need you to come here and here. And I'm like, am I gonna die? I mean, I didn't know, you know, they, I, all I heard was the cancer word. And, and so 10 years later, I feel like because of you know, you walk through it one time, you walk through it again, your response is a little bit different. But the first time I walked through it, I really dealt with being offended by God because I was like, Lord, we have served you our whole adult life. Why would you do this? Why would you allow me to have this? And I had really worked through the first time an offense with God. And so this time when it happened, I felt like what the thing that I was being challenged with is everybody says God is good, but cancer is not good, okay? And so God took me on this, on this journey of helping redefine my definition of good. We think good is ice cream and pony rides and vacations to the beach and but if there's a snake in your house you guys don't have those thank the lord i'm so grateful for that but if there was a snake in my house i would kill it and that would be good okay if somebody um if something um was trying to hurt one of my children, I would defend them and that would be good. There might be hardship through it. And so God was saying, we think good, God is being good only as rainbows and cotton candy. And when it's bad, it's just the devil. It's always the devil. And so God was really dealing with my definition of what good is. And so the first thing he did was I think what all of us kind of go through when, when we get any kind of a diagnosis or something happens is we just feel defeated. And we're just like, God, why? And, and I don't think God falls off the throne when we do that. I don't think he expects us to be these, you know, to handle everything perfect. I think he can deal with us saying some harsh words or being angry or expressing our, our confusion. And so I... I immediately felt defeated. So he's dealing with it with finances, and I'm like, I've got cancer. Our trip's over. The door's shut. I can't go. And God's saying, no, trust me in this. So the first thing I did was at church on Sunday, the pastor just preached this awesome service, and they asked people, you know, if you have prayer needs, come up. And so I walked up to one of the ladies, and I had never met her before, and I said, um, I've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. Would you pray with me? And she goes, honey, 
she said, God's peace is all over you. Cancer is secondary. God is trying to do a deep work in your soul so he can send you out. Now, she had no idea that we had accepted and that we had planned to do this. And so I knew that God was, he was up to something. And so then um, all of my friends, you know, I, I have a group of ladies that we pray together. And so I told them that. And they're just like, no, we need to just bind the devil. We need to war. We need, and I'm like, yes, we do need to do all those things. And so a few days later, um, God said, would you do, in my quiet time, he said, would you do anything for your kids? And Lainey knows, I would do anything for my kids. He said, would you do anything for your grandkids? Now, I don't have those yet, but I hear they're awesome. And I said, of course I would. And he said, I want you to have this surgery for me. He said, I want you to have the surgery. And, and in my mind, that was defeat. In all my friends' mind, I was giving in. I was just allowing the devil to steal from me. I was just, because we think, I think as Christians, that God wants to heal our bodies. I mean, Jesus walked around and healed bodies. But some of those bodies had been sick for 12 years. And they had learned many lessons in the dark times. And so I felt like God was saying, would you do this for me? So all of my friends now think that I've just fallen off the faith wagon and that, um, you know, they're praying for me to just, you know, buck up and pray God's scripture. And I did, but I really felt like what, the God, what God was saying through this lady at church and through my quiet time was, your body is important, yes. Your body, and he actually showed it to me we have an old car that has hail damage and all of our girls have driven this car god was like your body is like a car it is the vehicle that i have given you to travel through this life and when you get to the end you get to trade it in and go to heaven and you get a new body but so the body you know i we look at this old car and we're not like oh this car is ugly because of this scratch or because of this dent it adds character and so god used this time to tell to teach me that he's it's my soul that needed healing that my soul was more important to him and so um so that began to help this defeated feeling um, the first thing I did was, was, you know, when you find out something, even Jesus' disciples did that. When Jesus told them he's going to die on the cross and he's asking them to watch and pray with him, what do they do? They go to sleep. They just fainted. They just, they numbed. They, um, they wanted to run, and they did run, because those are all the things that we naturally do when we come up against a hard thing. But God was like, you, you can run, you can just ignore this, you can stuff this, you can just watch a lot of Netflix and just you know deal with it that way, but it, you're only prolonging the process that I'm wanting to do. And so the, the thing he told me to do was to begin to eat. And so, woo, but what he wanted me to eat was the word. And he just began giving me scriptures and scriptures and scriptures and scriptures. And he said, the word will wash your soul. The word will wash your soul. And so I was just so grateful, just the various scriptures he gave me. Um, I want to see if I can find this. I brought my very marked up journal. Um, Well, anyway, he just continued to give me scriptures. He continued one day while we were, I have a ladies group that meets at my house on Friday. And one of the ladies really, really sees visions of God. It's, it was just amazing. And so I had told them that, you know, what was going on. And so after prayer, she said, you know, I asked God if I can talk to you and, and, um, tell you what I saw and I said what did you see and she said I saw two huge angels which first of all I was like 
in my house. I was so excited. But he was like, yeah, she said they were just huge. And one of them was praying on your left side, had her shoulder, hand on your shoulder. The other one was laying on the floor and had your feet in his hands, just praying for you. And it was just like, you know, going to the all the world, the gospel of peace with the gospel of peace. And I just, God continually, through this hard time, he just continually say, yep, the cancer's there, but you're going. He's got peace. And then the, the next thing after I just continue to eat and eat the word and quote the word and pray the word, you know, a lot of times, I'm going to aside, a lot of times, and I am so guilty of this. I, I truly believe God for healing. I totally, if anybody has anything, I'm like, God wants to heal you. His word is to heal you. And I just go after the enemy. And so this time with me, he was like, you pray my word. It was like, he's going to battle for me. And instead of my focus being on what the enemy's trying to do to sidetrack me and what the enemy's doing to my body and how the enemy is stealing, God's like, meditate on my word. Yield to me. Yield your fears to me. And so every battle we walk through is either gaining ground in us or losing ground in us. And so... Um, God said, there's some things I want you to unlearn. And so I was just amazed at that because, you know, you hear people say, oh, you're going through a test. God wants to teach you something. But really what God said is he wanted to teach me is he wanted me to unlearn a few things. He, he wants my, our faith to be simple like a child. He uses a child all the time. And, and some of you more our age might realize this with us is like you know when we're in our 20s we got it we're going we're going strong we've got energy we can do a lot in our own strength but when you're older you realize I don't really know anything <laughs> I really I really don't don't know as much as I thought I did and so God was trying to do a lesson of unlearning some things in me, some things about his character, that if he's truly good, does he allow cancer? Does he use that dark time to teach you things? Are there lessons you can only learn in darkness? You know, he gave us a day and a night, but we only want the day. <laughs> we don't want the night. He's given us winter and spring, but we just love the spring. We don't love the winter. But he's, he's got lessons for us to learn in both. And then the other thing that I feel like he's really taught me through this time is, is really, if, if I hadn't had the cancer, I, I probably would have come on this trip saying, I can do this for you, God. I can run. I can't run as fast as these young guys, but I can run. And I probably had enough pride in me that thought, you know, I've been a Christian this many years and I have something to offer. But the cancer knocked that totally out of me. And I realized that what I have, whatever he's put in me, is so limited. Like, I love to love people. But then after about, like, five months and it's the same problems over and over, I'm like, People get over it you know my love ends or you know I love to pray for people and so you pray and you pray but when you're still praying for the same request a year in and year out you're just like we need a new prayer request my my prayers are limited but God is just teaching me that that this human nature of ours is so limited we really we can do a lot Rome was, wasn't built in a day, but those people, aqueducts, <laughs> I mean, concrete roads all over the known world. In a human strength, a human spirit can do a lot. But a, a, a human spirit yielded to God and turned to God and asking God to fill me with love eternal, like his love doesn't run out. And so if I'm doing it in my own strength, there will come a time when that strength will run out. But I'm learning to just literally just turn. So I think for me, just to sum up my lesson 
of cancer was to just realize that there are lessons to be learned in weakness. There's actually way more growth in weakness than in strength. There's way more dependency. And I'm learning that in my weakness, he can be strong. And so just to constantly turn to him. And so I'm grateful for cancer. Now, I'm not grateful for having a mastectomy and having to go through all that. And, and um, But God's like, you know, any scar that we have on our body is just the roadmap of where we've been. It's just the roadmap of where we've been. It's our story. And God will use our story any way he chooses. And so he's added to my story. So we just felt as we were as we we're just praying on how to close this tonight that if you're in a time of, of a weak season, a dark season, um, the two things that I felt like was were marriages, that if you know of someone or you know someone in your family is going through a, a rough time, a defeat feeling in a marriage or with children, to just, um, not that we have it, but we just join as a community and just lift one another up because the whole purpose of sharing this is to to just to encourage you that what he he will do for us, he will do for you. And so I just want to challenge you, um, what's your definition of good? Let God, let God change that if he, he so desires. So if um, Bob doesn't like this, but I'm the one with the mic, so there we go. So I just thought we would get in groups of two or three. I think it would be easier to share. Just, you know, if you're, if you're in a season maybe where provision and you're, you're worrying about provision, you're worrying about your marriage, you're worrying about children, just something you want to share and just let the one next to you minister God's 